G'day and welcome to episode 28 of the Sports Geek Podcast. On today's episode, we look at humour and Twitter. Where's that line again? And we look back at the year that was on Facebook and Twitter. And I'll tell you why Snapchat is the worst idea for sports. Welcome to the Sports Geek Podcast, the podcast built for the sports digital marketer. And now, here's your host, who keeps telling himself 40 is the new 20, Sean Callanan. Thanks very much, DJ Joel. I do like to say that I'm much younger on the internet. My name is Sean Callanan from Sports Geek, and you're listening to another Sports Geek podcast. On today's episode, we'll have a chat with Francis on ABC Grandstand about a tweet sent out by Cricket Australia and uh, some of the racial backlash that they got and some of the things you can do to check off posts before sending them out. And we also chat about different social media advertising options. I'm sure a few of you are looking at the different options available as all the networks, Facebook, Twitter, and a few others offering advertising and how you can leverage that. There's some really cool and sneaky ways that you can use those. We'll go into those on Grandstand. And then after that, we'll actually look at the year that was with Facebook and Twitter sending out their year that was. And we'll look review some of the stats and some of the big moments on those platforms. And uh, Snapchat is getting a little bit of press and a few teams starting to use it. I'm not a fan, and I'll tell you why Snapchat is the worst idea in sports later in the podcast. But first, here's my chat with Francis Leach. Front and centre again at the start of the Ashes Test between Australia and England for all the wrong reasons, Sean. How are you? Oh, I'm good, thanks, Francis. Yes, it, yes, it was. Uh, Careful what you tweet. Yeah, exactly. Um, unfortunately, the Cricket Australia Twitter handle, Cricket Oz, uh, tweeted a... Really unfortunate tweet, really, uh, saying, is, uh, will a real Monty Pantasar stand up? And it was a picture of uh, four Indians dressed in turbans as Teletubbies. Um, and yet it uh, caught a lot of backlash as a, as a racist tweet. And uh, people like Piers Morgan uh, was calling, calling for heads and things like that. And they were sort of effectively just trying to have a bit of fun. But uh, obviously it didn't, didn't go through the right checks to say, is this going to be a problem? And... <laughs> It has to pass muster, doesn't it? And just in big organisations like that, when you advise them, do you, do you advise them that they need, you know, like a check and balance in what gets tweeted? Because you, you can't sit there with, with somebody whose responsibility is to tweet away, say, at a test match and ask to see every, every tweet. But there's got to be some way of vetting certain tweets so that the implications of them don't become huge and, and uh, you know, damaging to whichever organisation you're working yeah, for. Yeah, there was a really good post uh, by the Daily Mail in the UK, and that's where it obviously got a lot of... Uh, uh, traction and, and response to the to the tweet itself. It was deleted soon after and, and apologies uh, put forward. But it raised a really good point on that cricket, it was Cricket Australia's handle. And official cricket, uh, official uh, cricket Australia tweet. Yeah, yeah. So it was off of Cricket Australia's handle and effectively that's the organising body. Um, and so an organising body is sort of held to a little bit of a higher standard, I believe, and I sort of agree with the Daily Mail, than, than, a, than a club or... Or, or a team or an, or an athlete type of that do have fun with this kind of thing because people can take it and interpret it their own way in that, oh, that's Cricket Australia saying that, that's terrible. Whereas if we look at uh, some cases in the, in the US and some teams that push the edge, and I think Twitter is a place to have fun. And, you know, we spoke about Shane Harmon trolling a whole, the whole of Mexico via uh, Westpac Stadium and we spoke to LA Kings and their sort of style and, Portland Trailblazers recently sent out a tweet, um, is there any chance we can be in the Eastern Conference asking for a friend? Because the Eastern Conference, the Western Conference, the NBA is quite unbalanced at the moment. And so... But that's a gentle dig. That was a gentle dig. And um, even the Phoenix Suns uh, right. chipped in and said, uh, do you want to get rid of us already? Because they'd already had two wins so far this season. You know, so they're having a bit of playful banter. Um, but when it's coming from an official organising body, um, it is taken them in a different tone. People do take that. So there's a couple of things sort of playing there that with Cricket Australia, like it is an issue to a certain degree that they don't actually have a team account for the Australian cricket team. Now, it's because probably the Australian cricket team doesn't have a moniker. For all our, all our other teams have monikers. And we look um, earlier this morning, you know, the FFA are on Twitter and the Socceroos are on Twitter. So the Socceroos can be a bit more exuberant and talk about, oh, it, we've got a really tough groove ahead, but we're you know bring it on and and be enthusiastic. And it's not efficient. It's not coming from the FFA, and the FFA can stick with a you know stock standard stock standard line. So I think that's one of the issues that uh, Cricket Australia has, you know, going via that one account. 
Um, and then the other part that the Daily Mail point was the, the, the model of we're trying to drive all our traffic and we're trying to create a bit of controversy and get more eyeballs, which does make, make the job of the person running the social media accounts very hard to do. Like they've, they've got to keep, keep this controversy bubbling along. It's tough, isn't it? But it is important. It also shows that maybe at this point, say, Cricket Australia doesn't understand the, the, the reach and the impact of Twitter the way that it should. Yeah, I think, I think they do understand. I, I think where I found it, uh, and it should have been, to me, it should have been stopped is Cricket Australia has a lot of its fan base are Indian. Like, you know, a lot of their Facebook and Twitter fan base, India is where cricket is at its, uh, at its fever pitch. And the other thing, the other aspect of this story that's important is that this photo was not taken at the ground. It wasn't in context a moment from the event itself. It was re-posted uh, from an entirely unrelated event. So it was, a, it was a proactive moment by Cricket Australia to actually create the joke, the so-called joke. So it was, in a sense, yeah, had in, it, intended to draw attention to Monty Penasar's racial background. And that's the really interesting bit here, that they, you know, that was the point of difference they saw here that was to be the point of the joke, which is that the whole dynamic of race and power and the exercise of power in, in the, you know, in the, the use of racism. So it's a really interesting lesson for them about what, 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 what they have to think about what they're doing and the implications of it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, had they have taken that same picture of uh, fans in the Army Army, Army showing that their support for Monty Panesar, then it would have been, you know, no problems. And the yes. text that goes along with it's important too, yeah. how you, how you editorialise that. Yeah, so, so that's one of the things that's, that's really important. And, yeah, you do need to have those checks and balances. So it is things like, you know, is this going to offend our uh, fans? Is this going to offend any particular groups of our fans? Is this going to offend or... Uh, our our coach or our playing group is it going to become the locker room fodder? Which is it's it's a minor thing, but it is something. Still, when you're in the world of sport, there's nothing worse than having uh, the head coach come in and say, "Don't put that stuff on the internet." That's going to fire up the opposition team. That still is, uh, which seems very 70s and 80s, yeah. uh, but it's still at play. And then the other one is protecting your sponsors, so you can't be, you know, showing off other sponsors in that are against your own ones. Sean, one of the other things that's interesting at the moment is uh, advertising options available to sports marketers on Facebook. Now, there's a gold rush on to try to make money out of Facebook, and sports teams will be at the front of the queue. What's effective and what's not at the moment? Yeah, so so there is so all the platforms now, for Facebook, Twitter, Google, they're all offering different advertising options, and to a certain degree, um, you have to you have to be part of that. To, to reach what you want to what you want to reach, but it is a matter of using the right ones um, because advertising overall has been interruptive uh, as a as a medium. So TV uh, commercials, radio commercials will interrupt the programming to bring you the ad, and they do try their best to target you to the right thing. But you know you could be watching TV late at night and it's not targeted to you, so you switch off. I don't, so, I don't need that Shamwell. Yeah, exa- exactly, exactly. So whereas now uh, the, the data that fans are giving up allows marketers to be mar- far more targeted in what they're doing. So the ads potentially, if they're done correctly, are more useful. So you should find out about products or, or your teams if that is in your sphere of interest because you've already said that you like them. Uh, and then the other things that you can do is – there's real some some real sophistication with uh, especially with Facebook is the teams can actually send you an an advert whether whether it be in your feed or on the side to you if you potentially haven't if you're in their database and you have not yet renewed your membership or you have not uh, purchased things recently but they know that you're a you're a you're a fan and you're you're already in their database so there's some of the things that potentially will start seeing. Um, teams using so these things what they call custom audiences so they can take their their databases put into Facebook and say please Mr Zuckerberg tell me who is in Facebook from the people we've got in our database and then tell us who's not a fan of us currently and you're like well they've already given us our email they should be a fan we want to start communicating with them more often we'll just send out a simple ad that says please like our team and then that allows you to keep that conversation going but then you could take it further to say oh who's in our database that is a Facebook fan that has not yet renewed from our membership. Oh, here's 10,000 people. So we can send out a re- an, an ad that says, oh, Christmas time's coming. Have you renewed your membership? So it's, and it starts to get into that space of, oh, it's an ad that, oh, it is a reminder and it is, it is directed and targeted and you're not, and there's not so much wastage of that. Let's fire a gun and, and fire it out to everybody. Because you can immediately find a use for it within the individual who you're targeting and that way it feels less like an ad and more like a conversation, yeah. which is clever, isn't it? Yeah. 
yeah, bit sneaky, it is, but it's clever. It, it is very sneaky. I mean, <laughs> and the other part is is leveraging off your off your friends' recommendations and also your activities. So the other, it's also a reminder that all the information you put up on Facebook helps build a profile for those in the commercial space to try to narrow down what it is you're prepared to spend money on. It, it does, it does. But the idea is that if you're you know you're paying for that convenience of getting an ad that is specific to you, so you might say, oh, "I'm looking for a good summer beer." And a savvy beer advertiser will put an ad right in your stream. You go, well, actually, I'm going to give you kudos. I'm going to give that a give that a go. So that's the opportunity that sports have um, in all in, in all the space. And we're all looking for that convenience. Exactly. We exactly. are. Good on you, Sean. Where can people find you in the digital space? Uh, SportsGeekHQ.com or uh, SportsGeek on iTunes. Of course, and the podcasts are up there as well. There is 27 episodes so far. Just hit 10,000 downloads. So thank you very much. Just let the balloons and the streamers go. Exactly. <laughs> Sean Callender from Sports. Geek HQ with us here on Grandstand Breakfast. Sign up for Sports Geek News at sportsgeekhq.com slash sign up now. So a couple of questions for everyone out of that segment, and I'd love your feedback. Um, either put the put your comments in the show notes, uh, sportsgeekhq.com slash 28, or even just send me a tweet uh, or an email, sean at sportsgeekhq. Com. I'd love your feedback on one, what checklists you have around your social media postings. And really for mine, if you can't put that sort of policy and checklist into a, into a tweet, into 140 characters, then it's, then it's too complicated. Um, and then the other thing is on advertising. Um, who is using all these different kinds of advertising to attract sales leads, sell merchandise, those kind of things, or sell season tickets? Um, are you using Facebook ads? Have you trialed Twitter ads? are using remarketing. Remarketing is now available on uh, Facebook. Twitter is now introducing it and obviously Google and Google remarketing. Um, I'd like to really know who's using that. We've done it with a few clients ourselves um, and use it ourselves here at SportsGeek um, and does have its advantages for different types of different types of campaigns that you're trying to do. Um, so I think I probably will do a podcast sort of focused on some of those advertising options and how you can use them in sports and and talk to a few people that have done them so if you're using that kind of uh, advertising please let me know i'd love to have a chat with you on the show um we are getting to the end of the year 2013 is coming to a close and so that means everyone starts putting out their year in year in review and this week both facebook and twitter put out their year in review and it it sort of shows a little bit of a contrast of one how they're positioning themselves and how they see themselves Um, so first of all the year in review from facebook um, it's in their newsroom i'll put it in the show notes Um, it listed um, a whole bunch of a whole bunch of things which is really really specific way of saying um, but it listed things like top 10 uh, top 10 life events of what people were doing Again, I still think Facebook is primarily a life blogging, uh, sharing photos, keeping in touch with friends, whereas Facebook is trying to move themselves towards a, a news platform and, it, and Zuckerberg keeps using the term Facebook will be the best personalised newspaper in the world. Um, even just the way that they put this news uh, newsroom piece out on the top points, it doesn't really reinforce that. Um, they did um, list the top topics of the year and again, this does sort of try to make it a bit more newsy. But the main thing is, it's unlike Twitter, it's not completely searchable. Um, so some of the top top news items, you would have seen them. Pope Francis, the election, Royal Baby, um, Harlem Shake. Is it probably the only meme sort of style content that made it in? Um, and a lot of the sports teams obviously hooked into uh, Harlem Shake, with the most famous one being the Miami Heat. Um, the other thing I think the big takeaway from the Facebook year in view is how people are still checking into to events, uh, they're still checking into sports stadiums. So in the US, uh, Dodger Stadium was the most checked into venue um, from ATT Park, Rangers Ballpark, uh, and Fenway. Um, obviously, baseball lends itself to more check-ins with more with more games, um, but I still think that is real, relatively untapped. The whole geolocation component, and we see Foursquare slight, slightly pivoting and, and making a bit of a comeback. So. If, you, if you're a stadium um, or you manage an event, um, it's, I think it's something to be very aware of because fans are checking in on Facebook um, and it is very much a bragging point from a, from a sports point of view. So you can check out that year in review and you can also do your own year in review if you go to facebook.com slash year in review 
and uh, you'll find out exactly what Zuckerberg knows and what he thought was popular for the year. So it does make for an interesting case study. I much preferred uh, the Twitter version and their year on review. Um, year on Twitter um, announced it uh, with a with an with an account that's now done five tweets. Um, but if you go to 2013.twitter.com, they have been using custom timelines. So I think this is the main thing for me to to take away is this new feature that Twitter is now offering from a news point of view that's sort of getting into the Storify space and able you to curate your own timelines. If you haven't played around with custom timelines yet, I suggest you do so. Um, you can make them in. You can make them in TweetDeck and effectively, in the same way that Storify works, you can drag in tweets um, and then out of that, pull the embed code out uh, to embed it in the site. And so that's pretty much how the 2013twitter.com page has been built. And so you can go there and check out you know, the top tweets for NFL and NBA and Premier League and Australian football uh, and NASCAR and those kind of things. So there has been a bit of commentary on what what sports and uh, what segments of sports have been left out um, and that's always going to be the case when you do when you do a year in review um, but I think it's yeah it does provide a really good way to to highlight um, you know what what happened in the year so I would be looking at from a from a sports point of view uh, look at playing around with custom timelines and how you could potentially use uh, custom timelines in your content because again they, are, they become an embeddable piece of content that you can put into your site so that might be the top top fan tweets for the week um, can be embedded into your site you can use them in that kind of story the only dif- the, the difference to compared to Storify is obviously it is only Twitter so you can't be pulling in Instagram pictures or Facebook posts and those kind of things which is what both Facebook and uh, Twitter are doing they're, they're fighting against uh, one another to be the only network that's it for the year in sports. If you're using custom timelines so far, please uh, send in an example. Uh, I'd love to share it on the show and in the show notes. After this, I'll be back talking about Snapchat. You're listening to Sports Geek Podcast. Send us a tweet to at Sports Geek. Okay, sports and Snapchat. Uh, so there's been a few teams that are starting to use Snapchat. Uh, one of the early adopters... Uh, with New Orleans Saints and they've been sharing sort of game day snippets and a little bit of uh, behind the scenes stuff on their Snapchat channel and uh, just recently there's a bit more buzz as the New York Jets joined uh, Snapchat um, I'm, I've been playing around with Snapchat and I understand what it is and I understand the buzz around it um, Snapchat is now the uh, platform, or you, I guess you can call it, that is getting the most photo shares. It, is, it has exceeded Facebook, um, which is obviously why Facebook uh, made a big play for for Snapchat. But the reason why I don't think it works for sports is is the fact that it is a private messaging uh, platform, um, and it doesn't provide any value or return to you as a sport, or as a team, or as a brand. Um, Yes, it is great to engage your fans, but you are only engaging your hyper, super active social media fans and you're not really reaching a broader audience. Uh, And there's no way for your content or your message um, or your brand to to go viral in Snapchat and there's no way to track it. Um, So there is there is a bit of a weighing up the options of do we go to a new platform because it's new and hot and that's where everyone is the old uh, fish where the fish are strategy Um, but for mine it doesn't provide you with enough return on effort now yes it doesn't take much to put out a, a snapchat but are you really serving a large enough audience to justify that um that pre-game video can easily be shared on instagram um which can easily be then liked by fans. People see it via that, uh, has, has some viral nature, but then also you're training your fans to take more photos and more videos of your game and develop FOMO, fear of missing out, um, on Instagram. So Instagram doesn't provide you stacks of traffic. If that's one of the, you know, that is one of the key drivers for you in, in sports is to drive more eyeballs, drive more fans to your website and then to your games. 
Uh, Instagram currently doesn't provide that, doesn't provide links to it, but it does provide terrific brand awareness and really develops FOMO. And you can track that. You can see how many photos have been shared from your venue. You can see how many uh, how many posts fans are using with your hashtag. You can't see that with, with Snapchat. Um, and the other side of Snapchat is the fact that it does have that, uh, I guess, danger element. It's already been in the news for, for problems around sexting and those kind of things. And the more that you engage with fans on that on that front, the more that you can potentially be connected with that. Um, there are a lot of athletes on Snapchat and it is only a matter of time before more issues, uh, if I'd be a polite way of saying it, uh, come out around that. The other thing is there are being proactive moves by all the other platforms to snub out the effect of Snapchat. Twitter now allows photos in direct messages, which again, I think is a terrible idea. And I know now uh, the pro athletes that I manage will be getting a lot of inappropriate photos on their Twitter feed uh, in their direct messages. Um, There's nothing to stop that, but that is obviously going to be a PR nightmare. And no doubt that that is going to be an issue. And again, you can't trust the uh, security of any social network it will eventually get out so twitter is allowing photos to be shared so it may drag that young demographic back to twitter and they be, may start using direct messaging and that sort of thing and then the other one the big player in the room that just uh launched this week um instagram now allows messaging we'll via its instagram direct um, option so they're all a lot of both facebook twitter instagram which is part of facebook are all trying to um counter the effect of snapchat um and i think that they eventually eventually will for mine i don't think snapchat will be around uh in three to four to five years i just think it is it will be a passing fad um it is effectively just uh, texting uh and i think it will go by the by so the reason i don't think it's a good idea for sports is that you are communicating with a tiny audience it's the same argument that i have when people say we want to set up a play-by-play uh commentary type twitter feed um that people can opt in on when you do that you're doing it to a smaller audience and you're putting in a lot of effort to this smaller audience when you really you should be looking to grow your audience and reach a broader broader audience so for me snapchat is a is a pure return on effort play you put the effort in to create this great content, potentially, but you're only doing it to a very, very small audience. Um, in the same way that Vine is now available on on Twitter, um, and I think Vine will eventually be sucked up and integrated into Twitter because people aren't going to Vine natively; they're consuming Vines via Twitter. Um, so I think the main thing is, is yeah, I think people are over building new audiences on on new platforms and I think people are starting to reach their limits of the amount of platforms they want to consume and I definitely know that sports digital teams and the content teams that are providing all the content are reaching the limits on how many platforms they can they can service their fans on um, so really you've got to go for the place where there is the biggest bang um, and for that it is Twitter Facebook uh, and Instagram can provide all the things that Snapchat is providing and I think there's far too much I guess, credence or credibility put into uh, engaging those super fans. Uh, those fans are always going to be there um, and you can do, you can serve those fans by running events and engaging them in that way rather than on what I would call micro networks. Um, so my main thing is, yeah, Snapchat, I don't think is a good, good fit for sports, mainly because it's impossible to track and it has no ability to go viral and help push your message. So that's my take on it. Um, that clock that's ticking in the background means it's time to dedicate this episode. Uh, episode 28, in, and you can get the show notes at sportsgeekhq.com slash 28. Um, I was going to dedicate this episode to my dad. His football number was 28. Um but I won't do that. Uh, I'm going to dedicate it to Marshall Falk. I was actually lucky enough to see Marshall Falk um, when he was with the Rams, when they were the uh, greatest show on turf. Um, he wore number 28 for the St. Louis Rams, and I actually caught him in a game when they played the Broncos at Mile High. So 
Marshall Hawk, Marshall Fork, I should say, is who it's dedicated to. Uh, this week's Sounds of the Game comes from Taylor University. Um, you would have seen this clip on YouTube. It did the rounds last week. Um, they have a tradition called Silent Night, where the crowd stays completely silent until the team scores their 10th point. Take a listen. How awesome does that sound? Check out the YouTube clip in the show notes, uh, sportsgeekhq.com slash 28. How can you develop a game day experience that encourages fans to pull out their phones and record every single second of your game and share that? Um, That's exactly what you want to be doing on each and every game day. Uh, That wraps up another episode of the Sports Geek Podcast. My name is Sean Callanan from Sports Geek. Please, if you've got any feedback on the podcast, send me an email, sean at sportsgeekhq.com. Really enjoying the feedback I'm getting so far. If you've listened this far and you've listened to previous episodes, I'd really appreciate a review on iTunes. It definitely helps the rankings, but then also if you could share it on your social networks, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and the like, um, I'd very much appreciate it. And as always, send me a tweet to let me know you're listening. Closing two cents. Snapchat is just not worth it for sports teams. Private platforms restrict growth and virality of your content. Please leave a review on iTunes. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash iTunes. Find all Sports Geek podcasts at sportsgeekhq.com slash SGP. On Pinterest? Follow Sean on Pinterest. Pinterest.com slash Sean Callanan. Listening to the Sports Geek podcast.